Um, <laughs> I have to say, this is, this is just an amazing event, and the energy and the power of Baldwin in the room is just incredible. Um, I think it has even, in some ways, altered my, how I want to go about talking about when I, what, you know, my, my sort of interaction with Baldwin. It's, it's helped me to think even more deeply of it in the moment and the, in sort of being here. Um, I think listening to that debate again and, and just seeing the sheer intellect um, of Baldwin, the power of his words, his persuasive ability to get at the heart of our very humanity and the misunderstandings and the difficulty in a large group of people, um, of European people, of people in power, people in authority, to actually engage that humanity. Um, I myself first came, uh, began understanding Baldwin when I was still in high school, mostly through my parents. I was raised in a kind of uh, suburban Albuquerque, New Mexico environment. Um, people often say, I didn't know there were black people in Albuquerque. <laughs> to which I say, I left. <laughs> um, which isn't entirely true, that's not, that's not entirely fair to me. My family and, and those people keeping on the struggle in Albuquerque, right? Um, but it did mean that I didn't have a lot of uh, literary reflection of who I was. And my parents, um, having come from Chicago, were aware of what that might be like. And through them, they, you know, on their own, took the time to teach us lessons we weren't being taught in school. And so Baldwin, as a political figure, I was quite aware of. But the impact that he had on me when I first really felt him and he moved me and I began on my own to really want to understand who this man was, was when I encountered Giovanni's room, which is why I chose to read from it um, today. One of the other readers that's here that I met back, backstage, which is really nice, is Daryl Pinckney. And he wrote an amazing book called Black Deutschland. And in the beginning, it starts, it says, it doesn't st always start with a suitcase. Sometimes things begin with the wrong book. In this case, the wrong book, um, and his was Christopher Schwartz's Berlin Stories and the Tell is in Berlin. For me, the story began with the right book, and the city was Paris. Um, Giovanni's room takes place in the 1950s, uh, Paris, and it's a novel that basically tells the story of an ill-fated love affair between the narrator, um, David, who's a young American ex-soldier, and a handsome Italian barman named Giovanni. Um, for me, as a young gay black man uh, who grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, once again, um, this was not a perspective that I'd ever seen in literature. More importantly, in many of the discussions that I'd heard in the political discussions about Baldwin, I did not have the opportunity to even encounter him as his queerness, him as a queer figure. Um, and somehow in discovering this book, the importance of that, the importance of that level of visibility, um, and the understanding that someone like me, not only someone who is black, um, growing up in the Western world, but someone who was gay, that the power of that voice, the importance of that visibility uh, was really key. Moreover, in Giovanni's room, the thing that I point to is that Baldwin explores the notion of shame, the shame that one carries when one is not able to be in their full power, their full selves. The shame that one carries when one cannot be fully black, cannot be fully woman, cannot be fully trans, cannot be fully gay, cannot be fully oneself and be seen. And in this case, it plays out through this love story because for Baldwin, what's at risk is that love, the notion of love, which is equated to life. And I think it's the most powerful thing to remember. So I'm gonna read from this book um, at a point after uh, David and Giovanni have met, and Giovanni has taken David to live with him in his room, and that's the title, and it begins to explore those themes. I'm gonna read just the beginning of chapter two, just the first two couple of paragraphs, and then go to chapter three. This is in section two, 
which sort of describes the room. I scarcely know how to describe that room. It became, in a way, every room I had ever been in and every room I find myself in hereafter will remind me of Giovanni's room. I did not really stay there very long. We met before the spring began and I left there during the summer, but it still seems to me that I spent a lifetime there. Life in that room seemed to be occurring underwater, as I say, and it is certain that I underwent a sea change there. To begin with, the room was not large enough for two. It looked out on a small courtyard. Looked out means only that the room had two windows against which the courtyard malevolently pressed, encroaching day by day, as though it had confused itself with a jungle. We, or rather Giovanni, kept the windows closed most of the time. He had never bought any curtains, neither did we buy any while I was in the room. To ensure privacy, Giovanni had obscured the window panes with a heavy white cleaning polish. We sometimes heard children playing outside our window. Sometimes strange shapes loomed against it. At such moments, Giovanni work, working in the room or lying in bed would stiffen like a hunting dog and remain perfectly silent until whatever seemed to threaten our safety had moved away. He had always had great plans for remodeling this room, and before I arrived, he had already begun. One of the walls was a dirty, streaked white where he had torn off the wallpaper. The wall facing it was destined never to be uncovered. And on this wall, a lady in a hoop skirt and a man in knee breeches perpetually walked together, hemmed in by roses. The wallpaper lay on the floor in great sheets and scrolls and dust. On the floor also lay our dirty laundry, along with Giovanni's tools and the paintbrushes and the bottles of oil and turpentine, our suitcases teetering on top of something so that we dreaded ever having to open them and sometimes went without some minor necessity, such as clean socks for days. No one ever came to see us except Jacques, and he did not come often. Jacques was the friend through whom David met Giovanni. Um, we were far from the center of the city, and we had no phone. I remembered the first afternoon I woke up there with Giovanni fast asleep beside me, heavy as a fallen rock. The sun filtered through the room so faintly that I was worried about the time. I stealthily lit a cigarette, for I did not want to wake Giovanni. I did not yet know <clears throat> what face, I did not know how I would face his eyes. I looked about me. Giovanni had said something in the taxi about his room being very dirty. I'm sure it is, I had said lightly, and turned away from him, looking out of the window. Then we had both been silent. When I woke up in his room, I remembered that there had been something strained and painful in the quality of that silence, which had been broken when Giovanni said, with a shy, bitter smile, I must find some poetic figure and he spread his heavy fingers in the air as though a metaphor were tangible. I watched him. Look at the garbage of this city, he said finally, his fingers inclined, um, indicating the flying street. All of the garbage of this city, where do they take it? I don't know where they take it, but it might very well be my room. <laughs> it's much more likely, I said, that they dump it into the Seine. But I sensed when I woke up and looked around the room, the bravado and the cowardice of this figure of speech. This was not the garbage of Paris, which would have been anonymous. This was Gia Giovanni's regurgitated life. Before and beside me and all over the room, towering like a wall, were boxes of cardboard and leather, some tied with strain, some locked, some bursting, and out of the topmost box before me spilled down sheets of violin music. There was a violin in the room, lying on the table in its warped rack case. It was impossible to guess from looking at it whether it had been laid there to rest yesterday or a hundred years before. The table was loaded with yellowing newspapers and empty bottles, and it held a single brown and wrinkled potato in which even the sprouting eyes were rotten. Red wine had been spilled on the floor. It had been allowed to dry, and it made the air in the room sweet and heavy. 
But it was not the room's disorder which was frightening. It was the fact that when one began searching for the key to this disorder, one realized that it was not to be found in any of the usual places. For this was not a matter of habit or circumstance or temperament. It was a matter of punishment and grief. I do not know how I knew this, but I knew it at once. Perhaps I knew it because I wanted to live. And I stared at the room with the same nervous calculating extension of the intelligence and of all one's forces which occurs when gouging a mortal and un unavoidable danger at the silent walls of the room with its distant archaic lovers trapped in an interminable rose garden and the starving windows staring like two great eyes of ice and fire and the ceiling which lowered like those clouds out of which friends, fiends have sometimes spoken and which obscured but failed to soften its malevolence behind the yellow light which hung like a diseased and undefinable sex in its center. Under this blunted arrow, the smashed flower of light lay the terrors which encompassed Giovanni's soul. I understood why Giovanni had wanted me and had brought me to this last retreat. I was to destroy this room and to give Giovanni a new and better life. This life could only be my own, which, in order to transform Giovanni's, must first become a part of Giovanni's room. Thank you.